So this evening what I hope to do is talk to you on spring build-up as to the way I do my beekeeping and such. This may not suit everybody else, but it's how I do my, um, my uh, how, what I do at this time of the year as such. So what we're going to do here is I'm just going to go through and we'll start. And when does the, uh, when do we start preparing for the spring build-up. I start about the second week of January and maybe the first week. And what I'm doing the first and second week of January and from Christmas on is I have nine or ten apries. I'm not exactly certain whether it's nine or, or ten. I'll go around to those apries. I'm around there and even before Christmas I go around once a month. Um, I'm going around to the apries. I need to see that they're still in good condition that hives are knocked over, that everything is intact. So I go around and the first thing I start in January is hefting. In other words, I'm checking to see, do the, are the bees light, are they heavy? And the other thing I'm also checking is dead colonies. It's important when you go out at that time of the year, and I'm talking January, February, March. You go out, find a dead colony. It's important that you go and close that up at the front. It's not possible to remove it there and then because some hives are in uh, areas at that time of the year which is not imp it's impossible to drive in <coughs> and to be lifting out boxes and bringing them home. But you can do that later on. You can do that in April. But once they're closed up, if there's a problem in there, you can... Uh, deal with it later on. The other thing I like to do later on is find the causes and this is very very important to try and check what have the bees died from? Why did they not survive? Was it queenlessness? Was it, uh, no semen may not be, uh, you know, it may not be uh, identifiable in the first places or has it been and this is what I'm finding this year is that the numbers in the hive, in, the, in the, some of the hives that have died, any of the ones that I have examined so far, the numbers of bees in the hives have actually gone so low that they weren't able to um, keep the heat in it. Now, I didn't see that as much before as I have seen so far this year. When I've done the hefting, etc., I then decide whether I put on fondant, right? And I buy the fondant in, two, in the boxes with two and a half kg packets. I split that into three and I put it into lunch bags. You know the lunch bags you get, seal them up. They're sealed in a bucket or two that I would have. And when I go out, I just get a hive tool and make a opening and onto the top of the feed hole. Now, if the bees are away a good bit from the feed hole, it may be advisable to have a, a, what I actually also use is you know, the kitchen toweling, the paper toweling, is get a dab of that and put it down over the top of the bees if they're to the front or to the back, if they're not directly under that feed hole. If you think they need feeding, they can't travel big distances to get it, okay? So we go on from the, do you see, if, I'm going to give you a few examples. In December and January and February, there is absolutely nothing out there hardly for the bees to get. It's important that we subsidize their feed some way or we get them going. And that's typical of an orchard there and all you're seeing, it's bare. There's absolutely nothing there. And uh, so, uh, I'll just, sorry, I'll go on here. This is the most important substance the bees need at that time of the year. 
is pollen. Pollen is their protein. They're now, I don't know how good the research is, but they're talking that the most important thing for bees for their immune system is pollen. And what they're actually saying is that it's affecting all pollinating insects is the lack of pollen. That when they have, I suppose it's like the human, if we suffer, if we, or if our immune system isn't strong enough, we're going to suffer from whatever diseases are out there, or viruses, etc. So if we're healthier with plenty of, if our immune system is built up, we're able to deal with it naturally. It's probably the same with, with the honeybee as such, that they need plenty of pollen. There's usually plenty of pollen in the brood chamber, except over the winter, it can go stale. But if you can, and you have pollen from the summer before, mix it with the fondant. I don't have time to do it, but it would be the right way of doing things, you know. And like the bees at that time of the year coming, they will go on any flower they can see. And if you have Mahonia, you will see bees work that like anything. And that's probably one of the few plants that's flowering in December, November, December. But come January, that's even gone. And what we're, we're heading now into March. Oh, sorry, we're in March. I'm behind. I'm as good as you, John. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, no, it's, um, we're into March, and the next flower that's going to be out in abundance will be the dandelion. And bees will go crazy on that in, in, in the, in the um, spring. They, um, they will they go mad on dandelion. But you need to get the bees built up to take advantage of anything like that. You need to, definitely, you have to be out there. As I said to you, I'm out there January, February, March. And I have to go out, and as I say, I can't say it enough, you must close up those hives that have died and remove them later on and just keep an eye on things and if you see there's a problem uh, you can you know try and deal with it before it, it becomes um, it becomes a real problem as such you know uh, this is just one of my apries that I, I have but I try to use mouse guards on the front of all the hives unless they have the, the, any of them with the wide gap will have a mouse guard, any of them that don't, I don't have to worry about them. Uh, the other thing that I notice, and some people will tell you that it, um, they don't, bees don't work them, is um, okay. daffodils. Bees work daffodils. Bees will work anything at this time of the year. If you're hungry enough as <laughs> this, you eat anything. So the bees, I notice them in daffodils big time, you know, so they, um, they, 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 you know, they, they'll be working those anyway at this time of the year, you know. Right, I'll just move on here because I actually have covered some of this already, you know. Um, I suppose I've said that about helping the economy along. Uh, the other thing is, and I just see it there. Do not, until the middle, or sorry, the first week of April and the temperatures are up, go at a brood nest or take out a frame out of your hive to see how's it going. You are going to kill the hive if you open the brood chamber and start pulling out frames in February or March. I personally think it's far too early. I will not open a hive before April. My reason and my thinking of that is that in April the temperatures are up a little bit. It is so easy to kill a queen when you're going through a brood chamber. And if you do that too, too early in the year, you will, the bees will no way will they build a queen cell because they're, too, they're out of the cycle completely. Whereas in April, if it does happen, and it does happen, you, they, they have some chance of replacing the queen if it has been killed, uh, you know. And taking out a frame of that, the bees could ball a queen very easily as well, you know. Um, I also, in January, I take out the varroa floors 
they're out all summer and they're right out until just after Christmas. I put in all the Varroa floors after Christmas because we need to build up the brood chamber temperature. So the queen now is starting to lay, say, from the first, second week of January on. And when she's, uh, when she's laying, she need, you need to get the temperature up to 35 degrees. You know, so the more you can, that can be insulated. Even the thing you could do if you wanted is throw a few newspapers on top of the crown board if you wanted, and that'll keep the heat down. It's like in a house, I think the majority of heat goes out through the roof, you know. So if you can keep it, the, the bees need, um, they need less energy. This, I suppose the ratio of energy between the bees trying to keep up the brood nest, it means that they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're conserving some of it, you know. I was actually talking to a guy the other day who's, and then he's, he was a lecturer on thermal, heat and I never realized this but he was saying about in the middle of winter on a sunny day in the middle of the sun will produce say about 150 watts of energy per square meter but in the middle of summer on the sunny day it's producing 1500 watts per square meter now I never knew that but it will just tell you that if we have a lot of cloudy days, the bees are, don't tend to fly, and now I can't, it made more sense to me as to why the bees don't fly like that. Um, as I said as well, do not, do, uh, do in no way stress the bees uh, early in the year, right? Um, I have the next one probably covered as well. The dead colonies examine, important, and remove when possible. And I'll just give you another one actually to look at, and I only discovered this last year, and that is dead colonies, and you see brood on the frame, and you say to yourself, why did this not survive in you? when you see the seal brood? Get a little matchstick, tear a few of them away, and you'll be surprised what's in those cells. And what I found last year was deformed wing in a lot of the cells. So the bees that are emerging had the formed wing, but the bees in the cell, so the varroa actually had taken over as well. But that was last year. Now, as I said, this year it may be different in that I'm seeing uh, the populations of bees very low. Now, uh, I'm going on here, first inspection, right? And I did a little bit, I said a little bit on this two minutes ago. My first inspections start the first week of April. I have to start either the first or the second week of April. If I don't, it all catches up on me. Um, so when I go out in the first week of April, I'm going out to check the colonies. Um, and the first thing I'll do is I'll go through it. I'm checking for disease, I'm checking for stores, and I'm checking to see how the queen is going, okay? And I'll clip and mark that queen. I'm not saying you all should do that, but I think it's important that you mark her because you may look, you may have to find her at a later stage if you're doing another job. Sometimes you will find that this, we say you have a number of colonies and you may have two colonies and this colony could have probably six frames of brood. In that colony, they may have only one frame of brood. And what I will do is I'll switch them. So I'll put the weak one that I have gone through into where the strong one is. So the flying bees returning are going to build this one up straight away. That one will catch up no problem. You know, that's just something I do. Uh, the other big problem you may have at the beginning of the year is brace comb. Because I, have to, uh, I didn't actually mention to you earlier on, I have two sides on all my crown boards. I have the deep side, I have the B-space side. And in August, September, when I treat, I treat with happy guard, right? I reverse the crown board and it's that way for the winter, right? And the other reason as well is if you do need to put fondant on over the 
brood nest you have far more space to do it as well. You won't have that if you're putting fondant on, right? So this can be a bit of a mess to um, clean up. So what, I'm, what I actually do is I will clean that off into a bucket, but I will not go through that hive today because I have upset it enough um, cleaning it off and the whole lot. It's also a very mucky job. I won't have that problem this year, right? Um, it's also, it's, a, it's very messy. So if I go to, there's going to be a bit of honey left there. If I go start down rooting through it, no. What I'll do is, on that particular hive, I'll put on my queen excluder, I'll super it, and I'll come back the following week. So what I'm doing is, I'm doing seven day and 14 day inspections. So the, the, I'm in my apiaries every week. The first week I go through the apiaries, I'm going to start now in April. The first week I go through the apiaries, I'll check them all for queen, queen right, see their queen right now. There'll be colonies in every apiary, I will not find the queen in this week. So the following week I'll come back the colonies that I'll be only going to will be the ones that I didn't get to like that one next week. So, if you, if, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So, in other words, that's, where my, that's how I start my 7 and 14 day inspections. So, the, so next week I'll be into that. Bees will have it all cleaned up and I'll be able to go through it no problem. If I don't find the queen there this week, I'll be back there again next week. But spending huge time opening hides and going back and forward for queens, I think you're also doing damage. So the less, once I go through my hive at the beginning of the year, and I found my queen, and I have her clipped and marked, I'll only go through the centre of that brood nest on every inspection after that, which should be a 14-day inspection until I start finding queen cells. If I find queen cells, I will be back the following week again. And if I find a... I'll come on to that in a minute. I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> uh, you know, but what I'm explaining here about is... I, 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 you're understanding where I'm coming from on the inspection, right? So, uh, typically, this would be a brood frame that would take out uh, early in the season. And you can see that's what you're looking for as the season progresses. Plenty of brood, there's brood from left to right there, and there's very little patches. And those patches that are in that brood are from the wire, I would think, at the back of the, uh, at the back of the, um, for, um, the foundation, sorry, you know. So, uh, so it, you're looking for those uh, those little things, and that. Mm. Um, this is what you're looking for: is the lady, and just clipper marker, and if you do what I'm saying, you'll have plenty of honey, guaranteed. But I'm just going to go on another step, and this is going to tell you how to do it, right? <laughs> Uh, now, there's your problem. Yeah. And this is the problem that everybody has and nobody is seeing it. And it's happening in every hive and don't tell me it's not because you go along, you break down your, all your queen cells and you leave one. You come back the following week, you break down all the queen cells and you leave the sealed one. Where did the furrow go? The Varro now have no cells in your colony. Varro will go in anywhere they can. That's the formed wing on a queen, right? I see it every year um, on cells that I'm even raising, where you will get the odd one. It may not show up as blatant as that, but you'll find, and I found it last year, I think uh, the queen had the outer set of wings, but not the, do you know the, there's four wings, there's mm -hmm. two missing on one of them. So there are deformities of one kind or another 
on queens. I would recommend <coughs> that when you're doing your initial inspections, keep your records. Record keeping is so important in all the hives because you will never remember what was in one as ten six when you go back the next week. Keep records and keep the records of your best hives. So your best colonies that are out there, you select them and this is a funny thing, your best ones are sometimes the slowest to ever produce a queen. So they're the ones you need to start selecting from. So how do you get the queen out of your best colony that's not throwing down a queen cell? My recommendation to you would be is to take the queen out of that colony and make up a nuke and let it draw down queen cells and remove them. I'm giving a very simple way for people that don't know how to graft or anything like that. This is, and buy a few apodillas, make them up, and if you have four, if you have even two queens that come out of your two apodillas, those apodillas are paid for. Uh, they're well worth running because they're, the big problem going forward is keeping, um, uh, keeping your colonies queen right. And last year was an awful year for queen, for queen breeding as such, you know. Now, the other thing which I'm involved in, I'm involved in the Native Honeybee Society. And it, 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 there was, there's research going on at the moment on the Native Honeybee. And we had um, a survey done on about 180 colonies. I, sorry, 280, I think. I'm open to correction. But they have been found to be pure AMM, which is Aphis mellifera mellifera, which are honeybees, right? So the, um, the areas that have been surveyed are those areas there. And the all of any of the bees and what they have found and is very interesting is that some of the bees became uh, they were bred out say the other strains of bees bred with them but then they came back in again so they went out but they're back in now they're saying they're 95 percent plus and i asked to know why they're not a hundred percent and i've been told that in science nothing is a hundred percent that they can only say it's 95% plus. But some people were of the impression that the native honeybee in the country was gone. It's, it's far from it. Now, why I'm, at, why I'm promoting it is, and I'm, look, I'm not anti any bees, but I think we have to mind what's coming into the country as in viruses. We have to think of the future. We're only here, we're guardians of the honeybee for so long in our lifetime as such. But there are people I would love to see coming in 500 years or 1,000 years time that could say that only for the people that have taught here, Ireland could end up, we're an, Ireland, an island country, the bee has been decimated all over the world. You know, a, there's problems, I'm not saying it's decimated completely, but there are problems there. We have to realize that, we have to care for it. And there's, these are some, just some of the results that they're showing that they came back. Um, what they actually do is, they, they take, we give them a sample, say, of uh, 20 bees, and they take one bee out, and they take the back leg off the bee, and that's where the DNA is done from because I think it's an expensive process, but that's taken as being a, a unit from, from the hive as such, you know. Um, that's about it. <laughs> Ask the questions, and I'll give you straight answers if I have them. Pat, there might be uh, occasions, and probably will be, we will all have, where you have a mark queen from last year in a hive. Do you verify and find her? Do I? Oh, I, of course make I do. Make sure that she's... Oh, no, so I free. will take nothing for granted. Mm -hmm. When I go to a hive, and there's a, a queen in that, and I have it in my book, everything is marked. I change the colours every year, and I see yellow queen. 
I'm not looking for a yellow queen. Sure, she could be changed in September. Yeah. So when I go back to that hive, and you will find that they will supersede perfectly, and you'll get this, and this is what I'm talking about, queen wearing your best hive could be the one of the slowest ever to produce a queen cell. How do you know? You don't know, because unless she's marked, and then you can see it, and you know the supersedure there. And supersedure is a, it's, it's a brilliant trait, and it's great, but if you're getting, say you have four hives, and one of the hives is outstanding, never thrown a queen cell, maybe after two or three years, maybe not, maybe you don't see it, and I've been caught that way, in that I've gone to a hive, and it was the, uh, the year before last, I know the hive, went through it, went back, say my two weeks later, no problem. Went back a month later and I see a new queen and the old queen. And I couldn't understand it. And they were actually working away. One was working to the front of the colony, the other was working to the back of the colony. So you can find that as well. They're brilliant traits. And that's, if you can breed from those colonies, you will get your honey then if you have, if they're good comb builders as well. We're looking for that. But if you can see a colony that's producing that are nice bees to handle, etc., you'll do well on it. Pat, you, you were talking about uh, a weak, weak colony and a strong colony side by side and, and moving the through that. Could you just go through that process? Yes, yeah, they again? don't have to be side by side. Yeah. Weak colony over there, strong colony here, okay there. Take the strong colony from here, move it over to them. But make sure you've gone through that before you do any of this, uh, just in case there's a problem there, you know. So what you do is get your weak colony, bring it over, put it on the stand of the strong one. None of this is done now before the, probably the second, third week of April. Let them build up a bit first. So when they're built up a bit, and just swap the two of them. You can do that at any time of the year. And do it as well for wasps. If the wasps are attacking the colony here, they have demoralized that colony. Move that colony over to another one. Put a, another colony here. The wasps will go in, they will defend it here. The bees will be able to pick back up over there in the other stand again. You know, that's a problem in August. Wasps will attack and they'll come in numbers, and they'll keep going and going. And unless they, can, if they give up defending, they're gone. You know, so I'm just that's <coughs> just something else. I'm, I'm sorry, Pat. Have you have you identified the queen then before you? Oh should, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. important. Well, there'll be no problem in identifying it in the weak one. Yeah. yeah. But it's important that she's a laying queen. She's not a drone layer. And that there's that, you, you look, nine times out of ten it works. But the problem has been is that the numbers in the colony have dropped so low that they're not able to rear the brood or keep up to the queen on her laying. So by getting the extra few bees in from the flying bees, when they go out and they'll return in here, they'll actually boost her up. The difference is huge, you know. And will they mix in okay with the, the, the flying no bees that? that are coming back are loaded up and the bees coming in there'll be no problem and it's a weak one anyway you know so they'll Come be in. <laughs> yeah you know they're coming in with food you know so they're they, they won't be um there won't be a problem you know so, uh, how do you encourage bees to draw home how do you what encourage bees to draw home how do you? Well, see, that's a trait I think in the bee. Um, how do you? That's a tricky one. <laughs> it's a numbers game. And I think this is my personal opinion. Bees will draw comb at the beginning of the year, right up to I would say the longest day of the year, whatever day that is. And what I find after that, they just seem to stop building comb. So at the beginning of the year, it's probably their cycle. If you think that the bees up to the longest day of the year are expanding all the time. And from the longest day to the shortest day, they're contracting. 